is the traditional reading from Acts. And this morning I'm reading from the uh, message um, translation. So it'll be a little bit different from what you see in your, in your pew Bible. Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run, and when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were blown away. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head nor tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What is going on here? And others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up, and backed by the other eleven, he spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, and also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. And when the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red, before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous. And whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's a delight to be here with you today and to be able to share with you one of my favorite Bible stories. I mean, this story has something that touches all of the senses, right? There's the sound of the uh, wild, mighty wind. There's the touch of tongues of fire, the sight of billowing smoke and a blood red moon. And, this, and then there's that strange sensation of being able to speak and hear in foreign languages. It's passages like this that inspire me to paint. And so this morning I brought a Pentecost painting. I try to capture all of the sensory images and the feelings that I get from the story. And some of you may look at this, this painting and think that it looks like a hot mess. Uh, in fact, some of you may have leaned over to the person next to you and said, my kid could do better than that. And that's okay, because the Holy Spirit always meets us in a different way. And all of our stories will be different. Anyway, I'm happy to share my Pentecost painting with you this morning. 
We often think of Pentecost as the birth of the Christian church. And we wear red and that represent the tongues of fire from the Holy Spirit. The fire touched the disciples that day, giving them gifts that they needed to be able to carry on Jesus' ministry. After being touched, they were suddenly able to speak whatever language their listeners needed to hear and to understand the message. Well, that's the short version of the story, but this morning I'd like to delve in a little bit deeper and talk a little more about what the Holy Spirit was up to that day and how it's relevant to us today. So let me set the stage for our story. It takes place in Jerusalem on a major Jewish holiday known as Pentecost because it comes 50 days after Passover. It's a day when Jews from all over the world came to Jerusalem, bringing some of their first harvest to be blessed by God. And they hoped that the rest of their harvest would be similarly blessed. There's a festive air around town, and people are uh, running into people they know, and there's also a lot of strangers. And they come from all over the world because Jews for years have been exiled to different parts of the world, and they've been there for generations, and so they speak those languages, which are foreign here in Jerusalem. Uh, but in spite of the language differences, there's this feeling of unity and common purpose. The disciples are there, too, along with uh, maybe 100 followers, and they're waiting. At the end of Luke's gospel, when Jesus appeared to the disciples for the last time, he told them to stay in Jerusalem and wait. He says, I'm sending what my father promised to you, so stay here in the city until he arrives, until you're equipped with power from on high. Well, that's kind of confusing. Do you think they really knew what they were waiting for? Do you think they were really prepared for this dramatic entrance of the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the backdrop to the story. A lot of people going about their business and celebrating, and a small group of Christ followers waiting for something that they couldn't explain. And then, in the midst of this Pentecost tradition comes a sound like a gale force wind, and then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit touching each one with the gift of speaking and understanding other languages. What a gift for the disciples. <laughs> Excuse me. They're about to start their ministry and probably feeling some trepidation. I mean, Jesus is a tough act to follow. How will they ever be able to spread his teachings so effectively? But then, all of a sudden, wow, they can suddenly speak so that people who don't even speak their language can hear and understand. And as people were hearing about these great acts of God, in their own languages, from people who didn't even know their languages, they were amazed. And they tried to uh, explain it by saying, well, these guys must be drunk. But Peter says, it's not even 9 a.m. yet. We're not drunk. And then he quotes from the prophet Joel. He talks about God saying that he will pour out his spirit on every kind of people, and sons and daughters will prophesy, and young men will see visions, and old men will dream dreams. Perhaps this, the birthday of the church, the festival of the first harvest, the dramatic entrance of the Holy Spirit is also powerful evidence of God's love for people of all nations. I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people, he says. And so he makes sure that all people with all their different languages can hear and understand. 
not only are there to be no language barriers, but there are no gender or age barriers either. Your sons will prophesy and also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. The Holy Spirit does not discriminate. And the timing couldn't have been better, right? Because all these people will be going back to their homes in all those other countries and sharing these miraculous events with the whole world. In his book, The Divine Dance, Father Richard Rohr says that the descending tongues of fire are creating mobile temples of people from all nations, speaking a universal language of love that allows them to understand one another's diverse languages. The birth of the church, indeed, God makes it clear that his kingdom is not just for Jews, not just for Jerusalem, and not just for Judea, but for all the different countries that these people can carry it to. And carry it, they did. I mean, can you imagine people going home and saying, hey, you'll never guess what I saw. There was this big wind. And then we heard these stories about God and his son, Jesus. And well, the word spread like wildfire, just like the Holy Spirit. Remember in 2020, when a few travelers brought a virus back from China? Remember how contagious it was? and how within months we found ourselves in the middle of a pandemic. If only we could spread God's love and grace like a virus. But it must have felt something like that after that Pentecost as people shared their stories and the body of Christ grew. So why do I think this is so relevant to us today? Well, first of all, I think it's good to be reminded that the Holy Spirit touches all people everywhere who are open to receiving it. It doesn't discriminate by age, gender, race, ethnicity, social status, education, politics, religion, or any of the other identifiers that tend to divide us today. And in fact, in today's world, where participation in church as an organization is dwindling, the number of people who call themselves spiritual is increasing. What if this is truly the Holy Spirit at work? I have a lot of friends who aren't religious, but who were raised in the church and they know God, and they tell me they consider a hike in the mountains as their church. That's the place that they encounter God. They might say something like, oh, I feel a connection to nature and to the whole universe. They might not call their spirit by our names, Father God, Jesus Son, and Holy Spirit. But we share a love of the Holy Spirit wherever we find it or whatever we call it. Maybe that's one of the divisions we can do away with. And at the end of the Divine Dance, Richard Rohr quotes um, theologian Catherine Lacuna. She says, the very nature of God, therefore, is to seek out the deepest possible communion and friendship with every last creature on earth. Think about that. Every last creature on earth, not even just humans, not just Christians, not just Presbyterians, but all creatures and everyone. However that communion and friendship works, however it happens in a church building or on a hike in the woods, we must celebrate and respond with love. The second reason I think Pentecost is relevant to us today is that the broken world we live in is overwhelming, and belief in the Holy Spirit gives us hope. There are so many dangers and worries and things that keep us awake at night, uh, poor health and losses, damaged relationships, abuse, 
not to mention the horrors of war and famine and natural disasters and climate change and other situations that are just so beyond our own powers to fix. My faith in an all-powerful God gives me hope that despite the fact that I can't see it, he is somehow at work in the middle of the mess. And if you go through your day with the intention of seeing the Holy Spirit at work, you'll find it. Maybe it's an opportunity to comfort a friend who is grieving, or a kindness that a neighbor does for you, or even a bipartisan solution to a complex issue in Congress, something about as rare as hen's teeth, but hallelujah when it happens. Look, and you will find evidence of the Holy Spirit. And finally, I find in today's scriptures a reminder that no matter our age or gender or anything else that makes us different, we are to tell our stories of how we've seen the Holy Spirit at work in whatever language we can. Just as those Jews went back to their own countries and spread the word, we go back to our families, our homes, our workplaces, our friends, our tribes of various kinds. We are equipped by the Holy Spirit to tell what we've experienced. And our stories are so important. Researchers who study spiritual experiences classify them in various categories, including God coincidences, God encounters, breakthrough transformational awareness, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, and more. These encounters with the Holy Spirit are reported by both religious and non-religious people. And these categories make them sound so special, and of course they are extraordinary many times. But then there's also our everyday garden variety encounters with the Spirit. Last fall, our church had a retreat, and one of the activities we, we did was to gather around tables and share stories of where we have seen the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. There were stories of healing miracles, of deathbed experiences, of feeling overwhelming joy in nature or with our families. I shared the story of my own family gathered around my mother's deathbed. And um, none of us had ever had the experience of actually being with someone as they crossed over from one life to the next. And we weren't sure exactly what to expect. Well, one of the people in our little group left the bedside to go into the bathroom and use the facilities. And when she came, she flushed the toilet. And when she came out, she went close to mom. And then she looked at us and she said, I think this is it. Can you, can you hear how her breathing has changed? Well, honestly, all I could hear was rushing water because the toilet was stuck and it was continuing to flush and flush and flush. But in that holy time, this became a sign to me. This was a sign that the Holy Spirit was there and that he was taking mom away. And I'm sure if you asked others who were there, they would have a different story. And that's just perfect because the Holy Spirit meets us where we are and in a form or a language that we can hear and understand. Where have you seen or felt or heard the Holy Spirit at work in your life or in the life of this church? I suggest that you ask that of each other and then listen, truly listen, and receive each response with love. I have a friend who is a great storyteller, and when he and his wife and other friends come over, I know that we're going to be in for a holy time. 
he, my friend isn't religious, and the stories he tells are not about the Holy Spirit, but when we're all together around a dinner table, something very special happens. His stories encourage stories from others, and we all find ourselves listening intently, and it often happens that someone in the group says something profound and vulnerable about their life experience, and it's received with love, and it draws us closer. You know how in some conversations you can tell if someone is not truly listening, but instead thinking about what they're going to say next? Well, that doesn't happen with my friend for some reason. Somehow, by the way that we listen to each other, honoring what others are saying, I sense the Holy Spirit is there in our midst, infecting us with love, letting all of us feel the holiness the specialness of our connections with each other and with God. Recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit is a muscle that needs to be exercised. So I encourage you to start your day with a prayer of intention. Pray that you can pay attention to the slightest evidence of love in your midst. Because where you find love, there is the Holy Spirit. And then end your day with a prayer of gratitude. And soon you'll find that your gratitude list is so long, it will put you to sleep. Amen.